I'm Dr. John Pelizari, Senior Pastor of Agape Christian Center. I want to say thank you for you personally taking your time to watch us on YouTube. We want to be a blessing to you, and anytime you tune in, I believe that every message is going to be life-changing, especially just for you. So don't forget, subscribe to us, like us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. We're talking about something called the cost of following Jesus. The cost of following Jesus. And I want to uh, do a quick recap on following Jesus. How many of you would love to be a follower of Jesus Christ? All right, so let, let's take a look at it. Because one of the things that churches are missing in these last days is that we should be making disciples. Now, the word making disciples shows that it's a process that we have to go through. Everybody say a process. So if you have a copy of the sermon note, if you'll take another look at it, and this is just, just a quick recap, that's a picture of the stoning of Stephen. Okay, it's when he was serving the Lord Jesus and uh, the Saul didn't like it, so he decided to have him killed. Now, we, we're talking about the cost of following Jesus, and I want you to understand just a little bit of background about Stephen as a quick recap, if, if you'll permit me. Stephen got saved, he joined his church, and there was a need in the church, and that need was they needed somebody to work the food pantry. And so what happened, the Bible tells us that as he was handing out the food in the food pantry, we see that great signs, wonders, and miracles were following his ministry. Now, you've got to remember, the only thing he's doing is handing out groceries. That's all he's doing. He's handing out groceries. And some folks are complaining about it because you have those kind of people in church who are always complaining about something, especially if you didn't notify them of any changes or anything. And so he's handing out groceries. And as he's handing out groceries, people are asking him, you know, Stephen, will you pray for me? Will you pray for my daughter? Will you pray for my family? And so in the Bible accredits Stephen, who's in the ministry of helps. He's not a preacher. He's not a five-fold minister. He's not an apostle, evangelist, teacher, or anything like that. He just works in the helps ministry. The Bible accredits him for doing signs, wonders, and miracles. Now, little did Stephen know that one day, doing just that would cost him his life. Because the apostle, uh, the apostle Paul, he was Saul at the time, had him arrested, and the Bible records that as they were stoning Stephen to death, Saul was holding his jacket with a smirk on his face saying, I'll put a stop to that nonsense. Now, I don't know about you, but that's coming down the pipeline as prophecies begin to unfold. But little did Stephen know that when he decided to join the ministry of helps, when he decided to get involved in the church to do something for Jesus other than just sitting there or showing up, when he decided to do something for Jesus, little did he know that it would cost him his life. There was a cost for following Jesus. He delivered groceries. Signs and wonders were happening. People were getting saved. People were healed. Arms were growing back. Things were, that's because that's what a sign and wonder is. All because he decided to be a follower of Jesus. Now, I'm going to pick up what we left off in the last session. So, one of the scriptures that we talked about in the, in the, uh, in the Bible is that there's a cost to following Jesus. And then Jesus begins to li list what's going on. And he talks about that if anybody wants to come after him, okay, that they have to deny themselves, pick up the cross, and follow him. So, the first step that I shared with you last session is, number one... It requires total surrender. Everybody say total surrender. Total surrender is required. So in the book of Luke, chapter 9, verse 23, it says, And he said unto them all, talking to the disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, let him take up his cross daily, and follow me. So the first thing that we covered was total surrender. You have to deny yourself. So I want to pick up on number two tonight in your notes. And the second thing that we pull out of that verse is that every day you have to carry your own cross. Not somebody else's cross, your cross. What does that mean? 
that means you're not allowed to criticize somebody else's walk. Are you getting this? If you think about it, scripturally speaking, the ones that really have that kind of authority to do so would be somebody like a pastor. Other than that, the scriptures tell us what we need to do with certain folks. Uh, those that have caused strife and division, avoid them and have nothing to do with it. But the ability to rebuke a brother, the Bible says for the rest of us, we should set the example. But for the ability to rebuke a brother is reserved for church leadership. That's tough, isn't it? Notice how quiet you got God. What? There's correction in the church? In here there is. Because we don't put up with foolishness. But what I want you to see here is the second thing is that every day you have a cross to, to carry. Now, what does that mean that you have a cross to carry? What was the cross used for? The cross is used to crucify our what? Flesh. Flesh. Jesus set the example. He had the ability to come off the cross. He could have called legions of angels. He didn't have to do it. But he wanted to set the example that the experience on the cross, even though painful, even unto the point of death, okay? Now, the point of death to you and I means this. We don't always get to choose and have it our way. Because when we don't get to choose and have it our way, sometimes that just kills us. But what we see here is that the cross was used to crucify the flesh. So the, the problem is in picking up the cross daily, that means there are some things inside of us that needs to be crucified, nailed to the cross. We pick up the cross. Now, how do we know what we are supposed to crucify? In the book of Galatians chapter 5, it has a section called the works of the flesh. When we look at the works of the flesh, it tells you that the struggles that some of us have on a daily basis that needs to be crucified. So let's take a look at that. Galatians chapter 5. Now, let me say this again. This is only for those of you who are interested in following Jesus. Only for those of you that want to stand before him and have him say, Enter in thou good and faithful. It's not for the casual Christian. It's not for the carnal Christian. It's not for the once a week Christian. It's talking about those that are serious about Christians who still have a passion to win people to Jesus, who have a passion to see people healed, set free, and delivered spiritually, physically, emotionally. People who have a passion to continue the work that Jesus started. Now, the problem with that is, if you've been a Christian long enough, you've gone through some stuff, that passion can grow cold. Mm -hmm. We get into self-preservation mode. And the Bible warns us about that too. It's called being lukewarm. But let's look at some things. I'm going to use the message translation because it just kind of really mm, punches us in our face. All right. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. What should we crucify? It is obvious, okay, that kind, uh, that kind of life, okay, an uncrucified life, if your life is not crucified, here's some things that you're going to witness in people, okay? That kind of life develops out of what? Awesome. Trying to get your own way all the time. That's one of the things we have to crucify, okay? <laughs> Let's go a little bit further. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. Stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, okay? Frenzied and joyless grabs for what? Happiness. For happiness. So let's break this down and let's see if we can identify some things. Now, I'm not talking about you personally. I'm talking about the person next to you or behind you because I would never do that because I love you with the love of the Lord. What is the cost of following Jesus as far as picking up the cross. It says here, trying to get our own way all the time. That means some people, they have a need to be right or to be in charge. That needs to be crucified. Why? Because if Jesus is not just your Savior, but He's your Lord, then your rights are forfeited and what He says is right and what He tells you to do that's going to be the directive that we follow. But some folks, they have to be right and they have to be in charge. That needs to be crucified. 
What that also means, it's an inability to submit or commit. When somebody who uh, uh, is doing this, they have a hard time being team players. They want to be superstars. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to follow the rules. They want to make their own rules. And if they can't submit to authority, if they can't work as a team, then they get huffy and they get threatening and everything else. They'll fuss and cuss, turn to someone and say, I know absolutely no one like that. Okay? So it's an inability to submit or commit. Why? Because once the new wears off, once the attention goes away, they no longer want to do it. And so there's that inability to do that. All right? Then the second thing it says that we need to crucify is now anytime if one of these is talking about you and you know it's you and, and you want to be just, okay, Lord, you got me. Just underneath your breath or in your mind, just go, okay, Lord, that's me. I repent because we don't want to give you away. The second thing that we need to crucify is repetitive, cheapless, uh, cheapless, repentance, loveless, cheap sex. Now, this is talking about, in this case, people out there in the world who are not married, it's talking about fornication. It's talking about having sex outside the confines of marriage. There's multitudes of Christians who in today's standard feel that it's okay to sleep around and still go to church and sing hallelujah on Sunday. Yet the Bible is very explicit in the, in, especially in Revelations, that fornicators are not going to make it. And so sometimes these cravings, these urges, now that would include watching pornography. Because Jesus said, if you look after a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery in your heart. Are you getting this? And so what that is, usually when people do this, they have a hard time with relationships or long-term commitments, and they're just no different than smoking dope, getting drunk. They have a hard time making long-term commitments, and they're just looking for a temporary feel-good, and that temporary feel-good never fixes the problem. And that needs to be crucified. Turns on and say, man, I'll tell you what. The third thing it says here. That we need to, uh, we need to uh, guard on the stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. What does that mean? Today we would say these are for people who are constantly buying things. They don't buy things because they need them. They buy things because they make them feel good. I'm just seeing how quiet we can actually get in this church. Okay. Now, let me give you an example. All the ladies say, I love Pastor John. All right. So, the majority of the time, if a woman gets her nails done, she does it to feel good about herself. Sometimes they'll do it because it's chipped or something like that. That's understandable. But just to do it to feel good about it, isn't that kind of a shallow source of joy? Now, guys, they have their saying, they have their thing too, so don't think I'm letting them off the hook. Now, remember, I gave you a warning. This is only for those who want to follow Jesus. There's a cost for it. So people who are constantly, you know, buying things in order to feel good, okay, and the stinking accumulation of things, they're buying things to feel good. They buy it all the time, and they do it just because, not because it's a need, but because they want to feel better about themselves. Guys are no different. It worked both species. And this is the one of the things that Jesus is saying. Let me, give, let me tell you why. Jesus said, what brings me joy, what brings me pleasure, how I get my sustenance is mine, is to, my meat, what nourishes me is to do the what? The will of my Father. And so he's telling us that in order to be a follower and pay the cost, that following Jesus and serving him, that should be our number one priority over anything else that we like to accumulate. It's not that God won't give it to us, but the priority is that if we become vessels to, for, uh, for him to flow through, then you become a blessing magnet. You don't have to pursue it. It comes to you. 
And what we have a tendency to do, especially in Christianity today, is we want to be blessed, but we don't want to be served. Turn to someone and say, there's a cost to following Jesus. Turn to somebody else and say, he didn't write these verses, he's just sharing them with us. Okay? Alright, so in the stinking accumulation, the fourth thing it tells us that we need to crucify is a friendly, frenzied, and joyless grabs for happiness. Now, there's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is based on the word happenstance. That means you're only excited about what's happening at that time. Once that whatever's happening wears off, you'll get bored. You ever hear kids going on board? Okay, so nothing's happening to them. So happiness, so joyless grabs of happiness is a lot different than the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord will keep you in the game when the happenstance or the happenings that are designed to take you out become stronger. I don't see how you do this because I've got the joy of the Lord. And the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah, but don't you know what's happening? You know what, what you're going through right now? I, I don't see how you're doing it. I'm not looking at the temporary situation and trying to let it talk me out of my destiny with God. I'm looking, like Jesus said, it says he endured the cross. He put up with it for the joy that was set for him. What does that mean? He looked beyond the cross and he knew if I can just carry this up this hill, Billions of people will be saved for eternity. And that's a hard thing to crucify. But that's a cost of following Jesus. See, we don't think that we're fleshly Christians because we show up in church, take a couple of notes, something like that, go to a conference. But true Christianity means this. Write this down. True Christianity is a crucified life. It's not accumulation of blessing. True Christianity is, not, is a crucified life. Jesus volunteered to be crucified so we can be saved. And then he tells us in Luke, pick up your cross, get yourself crucified, so those in your field of influence can see your crucified life and your witness to them will change them as much as what he did for you. But that's a, that's a cost. I don't know if I can pay that. I, 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 don't, I don't know if I want to crucify myself. I, I, I like getting my way. I've been hurt so much. I don't trust men. I don't trust women. I don't trust, I don't, don't trust humans. I don't want to do this. I'm not in the mood. I don't feel like it. I'm tired. Yeah, but didn't you say you're crucified? That's the cost. Yeah, but, you know, I'll just take a sabbatical and when everything's right. See, because Pastor John, last time I did this, I thought that God was just going to explode it and it was going to be mega and it was going to be big and multitudes respond and only two people showed up. Now, do you think that Jesus would have had himself crucified just for two people? And yet, that crucified lifestyle is very difficult for us. And again, what we're discovering is, am I the kind of believer who can follow Jesus and live a crucified life? Can I say, Lord, it's no longer about me, what I want, what I desire, what people think about me. I don't need to be in charge. Write this one down. I don't need to protect myself. It's all about you. Whatever you want me to do, you can write this down anytime, anywhere, at any cost. Now, I'll tell you when God calls you, when it's inconvenient. God will ask you to do it at the worst time of your life sometimes. When you're in the middle of a storm. When you're facing giants. When you're going through something and you just want to run and quit. God says, ah, hey, I choose you. 
I want to make you a candidate for a miracle. Yeah, but Lord, I've got too much going on to follow you right now. I'm just going to set this cross to the side. When things smooth out, I'll go ahead and pick it up. Because that way, if the cross doesn't turn out the way that I want it to, I can always put it down, wait for a better season, and come back to it. Jesus carried the cross and the storm, the skies grew dark after he was crucified. And that was total rejection from the Father because of our sins came upon him. Now, it's a crucified life. That's not taught in churches anymore. You know why? Because it creates the kind of atmosphere that we have here right now. It's serious. It's solemn. And people go, wait a minute, I want to be blessed. But sur a surrendered life is a life of blessing. A surrendered life, you should write that down. A surrendered life is a life of blessing. Because when you surrender to God, you become a blessing magnet. Okay, are you still with me? Yeah. Let's practice. I love Pastor John. Okay, that's, that's, not, that's not bad. That's not bad. We'll see who, who buys the hamburger afterwards. Frenzied. What's the next one? Number four. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. We talked about that. All right, let's go to Galatians 5, verse 20. What else do we need to crucify? Trinket gods. What? We'll talk about that. Magic show religion. Okay. Paranoid loneliness. Cutthroat competition. <laughs> All-consuming, yet never what? Satisfied wants. A brutal temper. An impotence to love or to be loved. Divided homes and divided lives. Small-minded. Everybody say small-minded. Lopsided pursuits. These are some things that we can find in people. That causes them to abandon the cross. I, I can't give this up. This is the way I've always been. The biggest excuse I've heard all my life as a pastor is, well, that's the way I was raised. That's the way I was brought up. Yeah, but you don't live with your mom and daddy no more. Your grandma's not in, the, in, in not raising you no more. Neither is your auntie, your uncle, whomever. But we use that as a crutch because when we look at the cross and say, I don't know if I want to be suspended between heaven and earth. Because then I have to change this. But in order to change this, I've got to change this first. And once this changes, my stinking thinking will work out. And I don't want to capture my thoughts. I want to let them roam. I want to have my mood swings. I want to be defensive. I don't want to trust people. I don't want to get involved. Leave me alone. And we always go, listen, we always go back to the days before we got saved. My mama did this. My daddy did this. This is the way I was treated. This is the way I wasn't treated. Yeah, but didn't you come to the cross? Yeah. Well, doesn't the Bible say that the day you got saved, behold, look, guess what? Old things are passed away. That life no longer exists. Yet we go to the graveyard from time to time to dig up that corpse and carry it on our back. You doing all right? Well, no, you know. Uh, my husband said something that reminded me of my dad. Pastor Karen said something that reminded me of my mom. Pastor John. I was just wondering. And again, my warning was, there's a cost to following Jesus. Deny myself. That's hard. Pick up my cross daily. I have to deny myself? No, I want to protect myself. I want to take care of myself. I want to make sure my needs are met first. I don't want to deny myself. I want what I want when I want it. Isn't that Christianity? Didn't Jesus come to give us cash and possessions? You want me to live a crucified lifestyle? By picking up the cross and following you? 
Turn to someone and say, I'm going to give him an amen, but I don't like what he's saying. So it says, trinket gods. What does that mean? That means we put God into our schedule. Well, I think I'll go to church today. It's an option to you. It was a commandment in the Bible. But it's an option to us. So now it's just a trinket. It's something we choose to do if we feel like it. Well, I've got a lot of stuff going on. Well, who doesn't? And so what it does, when you fit God into your schedule or you don't come because you had a bad day, God's just a trinket. Just a whimsical thing. Well, you know, I'm just going to stay in my home and hate about it. Am I talking to anybody? Turns out someone say, I, I think I, I might still like him right now, I'm not necessarily love him. Then it says, magic show religion. This is, uh, <laughs> in church, that means you try to convince people that you're this supernatural, really friendly, really spiritual individual. You come to church and amen and hallelujah, glory to the Lamb, but behind closed doors, your family will say something else about you. About your mouth, your temper, your attitude, your need to control. It's a totally different story. And this is some of the things that it's talking about right now. Your religion, your Christianity is just a show. Well, God uses me. He also used the jackass. Well, God uses me. Yeah, but he says, many will come to me in that day, and they will say, did we not prophesy? Yes, we did. Didn't we do many wonderful things in your name? Yes, you did. Okay? Thank you, but I don't know you. That's tough. A crucified life. Lord, it's not about me. I want to be real. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to go where you want where you want to send me. I want to say what you want me to say. I want to behave the way you want me to behave. And that's difficult. And it's not taught in churches no more. So here's what we do. We've replaced Holy Ghost supernatural services with songs and concerts. Instead of worship services. So you have a concert put on. Everybody's jumping, happy, clapping. A couple of tears may flow. But sometimes even the pastor themselves don't know how to tap into the Holy Spirit. So if they can't do that, if I can't have Holy Ghost smoke, if I can't have the Holy Ghost smoke fill the temple, I'll just get a smoke machine. If I can't have the Holy Ghost show up in, you know, wonderful ways, I'll just buy some light kits. And so we've become masters at church services. But not many lives are changing. Because after church, and you go wake up Monday morning, and that battle is still there, and you didn't learn how to overcome the devil Sunday, but you had a good time. We hear things like, well, I'm going to get my praise on. I'm going to church to get my praise on. It's not about you and your praise. It's about reverence to Him. Honor to Him. Worship to Him. It's not about me. Jesus gave the illustration. And this is a tough one. Turn to someone and say, like, the rest of this isn't tough? He said there were two men in church. One of them was a Pharisee, and he said... He said he was praying. He said, Lord, I, I thank you I'm better than all these people. I don't sin like they do. I don't have addictions. I don't have habits. I show up. I thank you that I'm, I'm so much better than her or him or them. I'm not that kind of person. And then Jesus said there was another man. He wasn't dressed nice. Off the streets. And he was on his knees, beating his chest, tears rolling down, stunk to high heaven. And he said, forgive me, Lord, for I'm a sinner man. 
And he said, which one do you think is more righteous? And see, we become the church. We see people who act like the Pharisees. At least I don't do what you do. Are you getting any of this? And so we've lost the capability to love a fallen, hurting humanity. And the reason for that is we put our cross somewhere, but I don't remember where I put it. I don't want to deny myself. I want to make myself feel good about myself because I've got enough going on in my life anyways. Is anybody hearing me tonight? All right. You know I'm just trying to help you get developed. All right. All right. So this, this religious show, okay, magic show religion, believing, uh, you know, behind clothes there's something different. Let's, let's move on to another one. Paranoid loneliness. These are talking about people who, who won't get involved. Not necessarily involved. They won't come to fellowship. You don't see them at a fellowship. They don't want to know you. They don't want you to know them. They, they, they come to church for years. They have no idea who sister so-and-so is. They have no idea who brother so-and-so is. If the pastor gets up and says, hey, we need to pray for brother, sister, so-and-so, they don't have a clue. Why? No fellowship. And this is one of the reasons we stress fellowship is through fellowship we become family. But here, what does it say here? This is one of the things they, they, that we have to crucify. Okay? They have paranoid loneliness. I don't want people looking to me. I don't want people talking to me. I, don't, I, just, I just want to be left alone. Why? Why do people get like that? Because in their own mind, they feel underqualified. And they're afraid that somebody is going to see them for what they think they really are. And if I let you into my personal life and you see me how I really am, then you have this incredible power you can exercise in two ways. You can judge me or you can reject me. Am I talking to anybody? And so now it's paranoid loneliness. They don't fellowship. They don't know half the people in church. They may have a position. As far as they're concerned, as soon as this baby is over, you're going to see my little uh, whirly whirlwind and I'm out here and you can hear their tires squealing in the parking lot. They don't want to get to know people. Why? Well, this translation says they're paranoid about something. Something's lodged up there that they can't get past that stronghold. Well, you know, <laughs> am I talking to anybody? Turn to someone and say, thank you, Karen. Turn to someone and say, he didn't write that. He's just preaching it. And see, now you got a choice. If any of the other message we've ever preached in here, if you thought it was the Holy Ghost, why we would we not think this is Holy Ghost too? Right. This is talking about leaving a crucified lifestyle. And this is why the church is no longer seeing signs, wonders, and miracles, not amongst the clergy, amongst the pastors, but amongst everyday believers like you and I. Why are there no miracles happening in Walmart? Why are there no miracles happening in H-E-B? Because we don't want to live a crucified lifestyle. You have these things on social media. I'll be praying for you, but how many really pray? It's just something we say. How many will really stop? Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray for this precious little girl right now battling this cancer. I rebuke this cancer in Jesus' name. And we think that's it. Did you know that demons are more loyal and faithful to a cause than Christians? <gasps> no! Shut the front door. The Bible says when a devil is cast out, it goes to a dry place. But it comes back to check the status. And if it's being cleaned out, he'll come back later on. Lucifer, Satan, did it with Jesus. He came back, he tempted him, and withdrew for a season, then he came back again. And so a demon will leave, leave him alone, 
And then once that person stops progressing, it says they'll come back, but then they'll bring seven more. They don't give up. They keep coming back and checking on them. Coming back and checking on them. Coming back and checking on them. Until they find an open door to come back and make it worse. And we casually say, yeah, I'll be praying for you. And that's a crucified lifestyle. And that's hard. So unlike Stephen, we don't see the signs and the wonders and the miracles. Because that cross, I don't know. Pastor John, you're, you're asking a lot of me. You, you, you want me to be faithful and loyal and committed and, and you want God to trust me and you want God to count on me? Yes. The world has yet to see what God can do through one person who is completely sold out to Jesus. It just takes one. Jesus was one who showed us the example. His one turned into 12. His 12 became 70. His 70 became a multitude. That multitude covered the world. But it started with one. What would happen if you and I decided, you know what, Lord? Anytime, anywhere, at any cost. And you'll be tested. Hey, get up, I want you to pray. But I'm so tired, it's my only day off. I want you to fast today. Yeah, but my husband's taking me to a steak dinner. <laughs> Are you getting this? Have you ever noticed when you declare a fast, the cheapest person in your life will call you up and invite you to, for dinner? And be willing to pay for it. Paranoid loneliness. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to get to know anybody. Let's move on to the next one. Cutthroat competition. Some people, they see everyone as the competition. What do you mean by that? I don't know about you. People like that get on my nerve. Like, oh my God. They don't trust you. Okay, you don't trust but what about trusting the Jesus in them? What about trusting that you'll hear from the Holy Ghost that if something wrong, he's big enough to say, ah, 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 proceed with caution. They don't do anything with anybody because of how they were treated in their past. And so they don't pick up their cross. They go back to the garbage dump. Behold, all things are passed away. They go back to the graveyard, dig up that old man, and this is why I can't get past the cross. Because I was raised like this. I was brought up like this. This is what I was told. This is how I was treated. And so I would love to follow Jesus, but I can't get past this corpse. Because it was crucified. There. Oh, but I, I don't know if I want to pay that kind of price. You're, you're asking a lot of me. I didn't write this. That's something we all Here's the beauty about following Jesus. It's choice. Some folks, they get saved, and that's it. Some folks get saved, they'll come to church every now and then, that's it. Then there's some folks, they get saved, they come to church, and you see the potential in them. You can see it. And so you ask them, hey, would you mind? Well, uh, what does that tell you? One foot still in self and one foot's in Jesus. It's a fence. And then there are those, they get saved. What, do you, what can I do for Jesus? Where do I sign up? But see, that's a cost, you know, and, and, and the biggest cost we pay right now, well, I don't have the time. It's too far. I don't have the money. I don't have the gas. I don't know if I want to do this. Are you getting this? Now, this is not a beatdown. You guys are looking at me like you're looking at the principal. 
This is the cost that it's talking about in the Bible. Pick up the cross. These things, if they're evident in our life, if you want to be a follower of Jesus. Jesus said that himself in Luke. He said, if you want to follow me, if. Your choice. If you want to follow me, here's some things you need to do. You need to deny yourself. You need to pick up a cross. And you need to follow me. You know what follow me means? That means you can't be in charge. You've got to let him lead. And he's going to lead you when you don't feel like it, when you're too tired, when you can't afford it, when all those things. Because he is going to take you into an arena that you can't control, and it's called faith. See, we like control. I don't want to use my faith. I want to be in control. I don't want to have to trust the Holy Spirit. I want to see a result now. And that's hard in the mentality that we have today because we're so instant. I remember, how many of you remember internet when it first came out? Yeah. AOL. <laughs> you would be cussing right now if we went back to that. How many of you have cell phones? How many of you got nice cell phones? Yeah, good. When cell phones came out, they were this big. They were like military walkie-talkies. Company B, come in, come in, give me a sit rep. They were called bag phones because the battery was this big. And you could tell who owned them because they were walking down the street like this. Today, man, we spend more on our cell phones than we do on missions. And so there's a, there's a price to pay. Uh, 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 there's a cross to pick up. The next thing it says, uh, cutthroat competition. Some folks just, just can't be team player. If they do something and then some adjustments need to be made, they get all huffy. <gasps> well, it was mine. No, it was God's. Cutthroat competition. They see every person as trying to control them. You're trying to control me. Uh, no, I'm trying to make it mine. I've got better things to do than trying to control you. Are you getting any of this? Well, you're trying to tell me what to do. Well, we do have some rules and some standards, but we use scriptures to set up the rules and standards. We're not trying to tell you what to do. Well, you know, I, 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 all my life, hi, here we go again. Well, you know men, well, you know women, let me make it more perfect. Well, you know how blacks are. Well, you know the Mexicans, huh? Well, you know the people from Venus. We always have somebody as a scapegoat. What about, you know what? I think I'm going to deny myself and follow him. Where do I sign up? I want to be on the front lines for what God is doing. Cut through a competition. You're just trying to control me. You're just trying to tell me what to do. I say, I hate it. Women who had a horrible past in some form or another. When a male figure says something, they don't hear it as what men do. We offer suggestions. Didn't I write about it? Yes. Hey, have you tried it like this? Because men are natural problem solvers. That's how our brains wire. We don't care about feelings. We just want to kill the dragon and go home and eat. We don't care if the dragon's had a bad day or whatever. Okay? That's basic psychology. Men are designed that. So when they share something, if you're dealing with an abusive uh, woman or a woman who's been abused, they hear it as you're trying to control me, tell me what to do. If I was trying to control you, my hands would be around your neck. Are you kidding any of this? You want to submit? Yeah, okay, now I control you. And so we use these reasons. And it says, that cutthroat competition, thinking everybody's out to get you. Everybody's an enemy. You don't trust anybody. I've had people that I've tried to help in the ministry. If you'll do this, if you have a problem, come talk to me. And I, and I make this recommendation. And well, well what's your source? Yeah. 
What? Next time I'll charge your butt. How about that? Well, you know, I, I need confirmation. Then you shouldn't have come to me because what you're saying is you don't trust my counsel. And this has happened time after time and time again. This happens because the person has been burned or hurt, and so they automatically assume everybody's going to burn them and everybody's going to hurt them. And so some of the greatest relationships that you and I could have ever had never happen because they can't get past the burn mark. Are you getting this? Not understanding that God sends people into our lives to be part of our healing. Sometimes the healing comes with people He will send to your life who will tell you what you need to hear, not necessarily want to hear. And you'll be so mad. Then there's other times God will send people into your life and they'll, they'll hold you and they'll rock you and they'll console you. Sometimes it's a balance. One day you're going to get a whooping, next day, come here. Come here, it's going to be okay. All right. All right, these are things we need to uh, uh, crucify. Cutthroat, cutthroat competition. Can I do a little bit more? Thank you. I'm not even going to ask because ask you guys just got quiet on me. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, my heart. All consuming, yet never satisfied wants. These are the people who are constantly wanting to improve. They want an upgrade. Uh, they want the latest, the biggest, the baddest. Are you getting the new iPhone? Are you kidding me? Well, let, we need to upgrade. This works fine. Well, you know, that, that's not the look. Stop watching TV and you won't know what the look is. Well, we, we, we've got to keep up with them. We're not giving a tour of our house. Are you getting this? And so it's all-consuming, yet never satisfied once. Hey, look what I got you. Oh, but I wanted the blue one. You ever have kids do that to you for Christmas? You go to the store, you fight all these people, you get that item they said they wanted, you wrap it up, you can't wait for Christmas, you want to see the joy in their face, they open them, that's not the one I wanted. One year, I just snatched them all up. Took it back to the store. Oh, you can't do that. Watch me. Number one, I'm bigger than you. Are you getting this? One year, I got all the grandkids books on manners. Every one of them got a book on manners according to their age. Hey, how you doing? Ugh. We're not Neanderthals. You come into this house. You come into my presence. You acknowledge my existence. Hi, Grandpa. Thank you, please. Couldn't get them to do it. Walk into church like I did not exist. I told them, keep this up, you're going to get a book on manners. They all got a book on manners. Do you remember them? Yes. Yeah, I mean what I say and say what I mean. I'm going to help your mama and your daddy teach you something. Small-minded, lopsided pursuits. Are you getting any of that? Well, let, let, let me back up. Few more moments. Brutal temper. Ooh, she ba ba sa ta ye. A brutal temper. Not just a temper. When you throw a fit, everybody knows about it. When people come to your house, you have, you have to explain why there's a hole in the door or in the wall. Why wow, you're so macho, you can punch through half a half an inch of sheetrock. Why don't you work as a Navy SEAL. Are you getting it? Now, this doesn't just apply to men. Did you, guys, did you know that women are more vicious? They will slice and dice another woman just by looking at her. Oh, no, you ain't window shoes. Oh, my God. Look at the whole cheek. Lord. What the hell? Hey, that that huh? <laughs> yeah, it works for both species. All right. A brutal temper. Okay? Some folks are cruel. Okay? They're cruel with their words. They're cruel with their actions. They don't realize what they're doing to their wives, their husbands. They don't realize their children are terrified of them. And that's a brutal temper. Brutal temper people always are lecturing somebody. Well, Paul, 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 Paul,
Why don't you just go your left, your left, your left, right? Now, all right, let me move on. <clears throat> they, they have a tendency to, to make it all about them, their temper. Well, no, I don't know. Why, why, why. Knows that quite a guy? An impotence to love or be loved. Some people just won't let you get close. You put yourself before others. Now, you'll do things for them, but you do it to protect yourself, to get their approval, but you won't let them love you. There's a lot of marriages where people have been damaged from their past, but they won't allow their spouse to get into their heart. They can stand outside of it, but this is the part I don't want you to touch because I don't trust you. Am I talking to you? All right. Divided homes. Everybody say divided homes. There's no unity. You and your spouse are constantly arguing, fussing, cussing, debating, trying to be right, trying to prove your point. Same thing with the kids. No unity. They're so used to hearing you lecture, they just don't want to hear it no more, so they just shut down. No unity. You don't work to have peace in your house or harmony. You demand to be right. It's got to be your way. You need to teach them, coach them, lecture them. Divided homes. Divided lives. This is, a, a divided life is a fake image of who you really are. Everybody thinks you're so sweet. But in reality, if they spent the day with you, and so you're afraid to connect because you're afraid they're going to reject. And so it's a divided life. It's a fake. There's a fake. Are you getting any of this? That needs to be crucified. Hello, somebody. All right, divided lives. You won't let people get close to you. You won't let them get in your circle. It's your four no more. And even in your own circle, you set yourself up for disappointment. Let's go a little bit further. Number 14. Turn to someone and say, I think I'm surviving this. Small mind, everybody say, Pastor John didn't write it. Small-minded and lopsided pursuits. You need more clothes. I need another. I need another pair of shoes. You got fifty of them in the closet. I need another black shirt. You got fifty of them in the closet. Yeah, but not this kind of black shirt. I'm sorry, I thought it went over your torso. I need a new fishing pole. You got fifty of them in the garage. Yeah, but I don't have this one. Are you getting them? Lopsided. Need more clothes, more money. I need another car. What's wrong with your car? Nothing. I need another house. I need a bigger house. You complain about taking care of this one. Why would I burden you with something bigger? Are you getting this? Turn to someone and say, he didn't write this. this. These are called, in the book of Galatians, it's in some of your Bibles that say, works of the flesh. It's the flesh that needs to be crucified. And these are some of the things that need to be crucified. I need to learn to be content, to be happy with what I have. I need to learn to be appreciative. If God has put people into my life, I need to trust the Jesus that's in them. And that's difficult because it's a hurting world. Some folks, you know, this accumulation here, uh, or, or pursuits, some people want more recognition. They want more attention. More recognition, more attention. Hey, how come I didn't get a certificate of appreciation? I, 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 uh, I, I changed toilet paper once. Sorry, we overlooked it. Yeah, but how come you always go to Jalisco's with them, but you never ask me? I, I don't know. I don't make that decision. After I get through preaching, my brain is full. I've said my 23,000 words for a guy, and I shift into, honey, make a decision mode. Where do you want to go? Are you getting this? And so now, the choice that we have is, some of y'all, I know some of y'all are acting like I beat you upside the head with a toothbrush. These are, this is a choice. Am I willing to give up any of these things that the Holy Spirit exposed tonight in exchange for signs, wonders, and miracles? 
not for me, but to be a vessel to get that into the life of someone else. That's the crucified life. It's not about me, how I feel, what I want. Couldn't care less what people think. I want to please Him. That's so hard. But that's the cost. Yeah, but Brother John, I, you know, I'm not, um, I, I, I know, I'll just let you do it because you're the preacher. Well, my job is to teach you how to do it. And to encourage you to do it. And let you know you can do it. To also let you know you're called to do it. To let you know that Jesus expects you to do it. Well, you know, I'm, I'm happy that being a believer. Well, the Bible says, these signs shall follow them that believe. So there should be evidence that you're a believer. Lay hands on the sick. But if you don't lay hands on the sick, if you don't show up to lay hands on the sick. Are you getting this? And so Stephen didn't realize it was going to cost him his life. Jesus, when he took up his cross, it cost him his life. But I would rather go through a temporary crucifixion here so I can live a life of rewards there. And you have to determine where your value system is. One of the things that Christians don't do anymore is lay up treasure in heaven because we want our treasure now. Jesus came to wash away our sins. Then before he ascended, he also said, I'm, I'm looking for some more. He'll finish my work. He'll do whatever needs to be done. He said, I've done the will of my Father. The Bible tells us that Jesus was obedient even unto death. That means sometimes the things that we have to do or go through, God, this is killing me. Welcome to Calvary. But I don't want to. Want to. Jesus went through the same thing. My God, my God, have you forsaken me? This was not part of the deal. He wanted to get out of it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he's praying. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And he sweat blood because it was such an intense mental warfare. And yet he chose to live a surrendered life to his Father. May I just challenge you, encourage you, I know some of you think I beat you. May I just challenge you or encourage you tonight to examine yourself and say, Lord, I want to be a last day's vessel that you can count on me anytime, anywhere, at any cost. I want to be someone that if something comes up, if you'll give me the command, the commission, I'll lay hands on the sick. I'll cast out devils. I'll sow that seed. I'll, I'll do what I need to do. I'll be that blessing. I'll be that example. It's not about me. One of the things I tell people when they get into the ministry, they want to get involved, and when they're considering the leadership, I give them the scripture where Jesus said, if you don't hate your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your hands, your, your, your lands, your houses, your jobs, your money, and everything else, he says, you can't follow me. That's a cost. I didn't write it, but that's a cost. And not many people can do that. So there's only a few. I don't know if the Lord's been calling some of you to report for duty. Maybe you were in Walmart and the Holy Ghost said, go lay hands on him. And you argued with God. What if it doesn't work? Like the devil's going to ask you. Maybe you were in the parking lot and you saw someone struggling. And the Holy Ghost said, go give him a word of encouragement. Well, I don't know. I don't want people to think I'm crazy or a religious nut. Nowadays, you don't know. I might get stabbed. 
We don't know. But that's the cost. It can be terrifying. That's true. But I read the back of the book, and you might want to write this down. The rewards are out of this world. Is there anyone here tonight? Don't answer. Who can pick up their cross? Lord, I, you showed me tonight that there's some things I need to crucify. I'm willing to. I just want to hear you say, well done. Does this bear witness with anybody? Yes. Amen. I don't think you're here by accident. And I think God has been calling, summoning, maybe even demanding, if I may say that, for some of you to report for duty because the kingdom needs you. There's the people who need to hear what you have to say. They need to see your smile. They need to see Jesus in you. They need your hands. They need your encouragement. They need your, your, your master's touch. They need your vocation. You can minister them through your job. You can minister to them in social events. But God is looking for some. We want to close this gap. We want to fill up a page in the Lamb's Book of Life. Some of you, maybe you've lost your fire, you're tired, welcome to the club. But the devil is trying to wear out the saints in the last days, so that should be a good sign. That means we should lace up our combat boots, wipe the sweat off, wipe the blood off, get up and do it again. And never let the devil think that what he's doing to you is going to work. Can I have an amen? amen? Let's become some spiritual marines. Amen? God bless you. Give the Lord a hand clap. You're learning from you. Has God been tugging at your heart about picking up the cross? It's a sacrificial lifestyle. It's a submitted lifestyle. It's a committed lifestyle. It's inconvenient. You're not going to like it. You may not be appreciated, you may not be recognized, you may be ridiculed, it may not turn out the way that you thought. All of those things are irrelevant. The Bible tells us that obedience is better than sacrifice. I just want to be obedient. If God's been tugging at your heart, let me just leave you with this. Sometime, possibly tonight, tomorrow, this week, would you answer the call, get your orders from headquarters, and let's become an intimidating army that we're not afraid of the devil. We know how to punch back, and we punch hard. Amen? Amen. Give the Lord one more hand clap. I'm Dr. John Pelizari, Senior Pastor of Agape Christian Center. I want to say thank you for you personally taking your time to watch us on YouTube. We want to be a blessing to you, and anytime you tune in, I believe that every message is going to be life-changing, especially just for you. So don't forget, subscribe to us, like us, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for